Welcome back to my Animal Education Series. Today I'm here with Chris at the Mesker Park Zoo. Hello. Hey. So, today we're going to be talking about multi-species enclosures. So, what all do we have in the enclosure behind us? So we're in Amazonia, the free flight part of the aviary has a, just a whole bunch of animals. You can consider this an exhibit for the tapir, the capybara, three species of ducks, scarlet ibis, roseate spoonbill, silverbeak tanager, blue gray tanager, the mod mod, yellow, yellow rump caciques, which are yelling behind us. Just a whole bunch of stuff. Just a bunch. Whole bunch. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, I think the easiest thing to think about is how do I feed all of these animals with all of these diets without them eating each other's food? And for some of these animals, it means being okay with it. Like a lot of the free flight birds, if they run over and eat somebody else's worms, that's just, that's just what it's gonna be. But I definitely don't want the tapir to be eating my meat diet for the scarlet ibis. So, sometimes it takes a little bit of trial and error to make sure that he can definitely not reach the food bowl, and that's where we're at now. So we've got uh, feeders up on branches that are too far for the tapir to get so that the roseate spoonbill and the scarlet ibis can come out and feed from those. Now, when I'm thinking about animals, I definitely don't want to eat the same, their food. Sometimes it means pulling them off exhibit and feeding them back there. Or like, say the animal gets a little territorial about their food, like they do with the capybara and the tapir. In that situation, we do feed them some of their diet back there in their own individual holding areas. And I think you'll find that in a lot of different zoos that have mixed species. Sometimes they get food on exhibit, sometimes they get food off exhibit in order to make sure that their nutritional needs are met. And I look it around, there's no real barrier between this pathway and this enclosure, but the birds are kind of free flying. Oh yeah. So do they have feeders like uh, in other places in the building? Yes. So if I'm a bird, I could choose from feeders in the catch cage, which is another thing about you know such a large exhibit. We have to have a place to catch these free flight birds. So we feed them in there. There's another cage back there. There's a food bowl area in which we will be getting a catch cage because we need to catch these birds soon because of a different project. And then various bowls on exhibit for more of the wading birds. So if I'm a little tweety bird, I got a bunch of places I can find them. And obviously, Kaibara can't fly and go there. No, other thank places. goodness. So do you ever take advantage of like which areas they prefer uh, for feeding? Yeah, maybe not necessarily in this exhibit. I mean, kind of. We. If we're feeding them on exhibit, we tend to feed them right by where their shift door is. So the capybara tends to get food over there where it immediately comes out, so that's like its first option. It sees that and goes, okay, I'll eat that first. It'll give the paper some time to eat its food before I go over and try to steal that. So I guess in a way we do take advantage of where we expect them to be. Yeah. And like with some of the ducks in here, like, um, do they have some of those flight feathers uh, clipped so that they can fly still or no? These ones are actually fully flighted, so they can fly around. Uh, sometimes that can be a difficulty when it comes to catching them, so we might take advantage of when they're losing their feathers. And for our one duck species, sometimes it means they interact with the public a little too much. We kind of wish they would not do that so much, but so far it's been okay. Another hard part I imagine is finding what animals go together in an enclosure. Yes, sometimes it is knowledge based on previous experience, uh, sometimes it's knowledge based on temperament, and sometimes you just kind of have to train them to deal with it. It might be introducing an animal in a way that's safe, where they can interact with each other in a safe environment, maybe through a howdy cage for some of our birds, you do have areas that kind of double as that. Thank you so much for telling us about this enclosure here. Welcome. And now let's go move over to Australia. And now we're here with Nora in the Australia portion of the zoo. And you, you may remember her from our uh, dietary video. Yeah. So you've been promoted. Yeah, well, I've swapped areas now. Still working with different diets, but just not primarily diets. And that, you're telling us off camera that diet is still very important here as well. Yes. Definitely. And let's start off with what animals do you have in this enclosure? So right now, uh, kind of changes depending on the seasons, but right now we have our three goats over here. We have our miniature horse, Clarence, and then we also have our two male emu out in the yard. And you're telling us that Clarence is kind of a pig. He's a little bit chunkier. He very much is focused on food. He loves to eat, which all the animals do, but he likes to be a chow hound. So that's something we do have to take into consideration when putting the animals out is, hey, is Clarence going to be 
chowing down on everything. Is he going to try and get all the animals other food? So we have to very much keep a watch on that. And how do you go about like kind of make sure that all the animals are getting the foods and Clarence doesn't steal all of it? Right. So what we do is we, for the emu, again, we have bird food. We have special food for our more geriatric animals. And we have to kind of keep an eye on Clarence there. So a lot of times we have to do is kind of do the majority of the food for animals in the evening. And so we put out our emu food out in the evening and we try to make sure we pick up as much of it when the animals come out here so Clarence doesn't vacuum it all up because he really likes, a lot of those stuff we found, really like the emu food or all the ostrich grain, what it's called. Because the ostrich and our rhea and all the other emus that we have get the grain as well. And so what we also do is we put some hay out here, Clarence gets his special grain that he gets in the PM, and then same with our goats, they get their special grain in the PM. So we don't want to put everything out in the day where everyone kind of just do a free-for-all. They get like a little bit of hay that they can do natural behaviors like browsing and grazing and whatnot, but then we, they can focus on it. We can separate animals in the PM and we have to do special needs like uh, medications and whatnot. So even though these aren't all necessarily Australian animals besides the emu, like how did they all like work together um, in this enclosure? Well, and most of the time with introducing animals, you have to do a lot of like slow introductions because you don't know yeah. if they're going to actually work well together. Especially you have emu who are known to be jumpers and kickers, and those are some very strong legs. You got horses that can buck and just anything that can happen. So you do kind of slow introduction and it's nice that they have a big yard so they can get away from each other. And this over here, I guess, a unique situation where, well, we need to kind of have some space where we may not space over here, but we want to rotate animals around so they can still get out, be on exhibit, still have the best life that they can have. And so what we do is we kind of just put them together and say, okay, let's see if this will work. This may not work. If we're noticing that something is not working well, we say, okay, what can we do to reassess the situation? And so one of those, we want to make sure that our geriatric goats out here get to come out here and enjoy the sun, we get to go cozy around. It may not work well with the other goats we have in contact with. So, you know, so there are goats over there, but we found out they didn't work well with the other goats. They really tried to beat up on Leroy, who's very old. And so we didn't want some aggression and something else going around. So again, it's a lot of introducing or introducing our animals together and saying, okay, is this going to work? What do we need to change? You know, do we have enough space for them? Is there a way that they can get away from each other? A lot of those things that we have to look at is we're putting animals together with any situation. And now there's a Siberian tiger in the background. I don't know if the camera will be able to hear it, but he's been calling for about the last 15 minutes. And it's a unique call. And does the tiger affect the animals here at all? Or? Not usually, yeah. I mean, not that I've heard anywhere here. We do actually can, we can take a lot of our animals, the contact, not a lot of animals, but our horse, Clarence, our mini horse, our goats, and our dogs, we can walk them around the zoo on leashes and harnesses. And that's fun for a lot of animals, and especially the tiger, because then the tiger gets to see this different animal walking around right by the exhibit gets unique smells as well so that's fun for them but for the tiger making that call really doesn't affect these animals i think they're kind of used to it now maybe if they first came to the zoo something that'd be unique for them but even our talking who's right next door to the tiger they could care less they're probably like, especially with the talking they can definitely see the tiger mm -hmm. like oh, you're over there i'm over here you're trapped, I'm trapped, we're good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they just, they acknowledge each other and say, hey, we're over here. The tiger seems much more interested in what's going on in our talking exhibit, if things are going on, if our female, if she's playing around, if she's doing something unique, uh, the tiger definitely seems much more interested in saying, oh, something unique's going on over here. It is much more interesting than talking being into the tiger. Well, thank you so much for telling us about the enclosure here. Yeah, not a problem. And I hope you guys enjoyed this week's episode. Don't forget to leave a big thumbs up down below. Subscribe to my channel. And also check out my Instagram, at Paul Shirk. As always, I'll see you next week.